getting under your skin next on call with the prairie doc good evening and welcome to on call with the prairie doc we're coming to you live from the studios of south dakota public television in vermilion tonight we were involved in meetings here this week and SDPB was gracious enough to allow us into their facilities, which is great. One might say that the skin is sometimes thought of as the redheaded stepchild of the body parts. We'd like it to look good, but we don't always give it the respect it deserves as the organ that keeps us, well, all together. We may only pay attention to it when something is wrong, a rash or a cut. The skin remains vitally important for more than structural and cosmetic purposes. It interacts directly with our internal parts. It protects us. It absorbs vitamins. It communicates important environmental data to the brain. It's important. But first, let's take a look at this week's Prairie Doc quiz question. It's a fill-in-the-blank question. In the upper prairie, mid-portion of our country, especially in the winter, the most common cause for a rash is fill in the blank. Viewers who call in the correct answer will be entered into a drawing to win a signed copy of our book, The Picture of Health. Each of my essays originally written for this show comes with a wonderful accompanying photograph by Dr. Judith Peterson. We'll announce the answer and the winner at the end of the show. But remember, you have only 10 minutes for that question, but you have the whole time to ask your questions concerning diseases of the skin, treatments and methods of prevention, as they're called. And as you call in or you send them to us, do it by Facebook or email or call in your questions to 1-888-376-6225 or send us an email to the address on the screen. To help us answer your questions tonight, we have three wonderful doctors. First, John Walner from Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Next is Dr. Louis Hogruff of Regional Health in Rapid City, South Dakota. And filling out tonight's panel is our old friend, Dr. I mean, young in heart, young, young guy, but been our friend for a long time, Dr. Jim McGrand of Dakota Dermatology in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Let's dive right into the topic tonight. Uh, what is the one piece of advice you'd find yourselves giving to most of your patients. John, what one advice would you like them to take home? Because this is, we'll start with that. I, I think what I do so much of the time, Rick, is I'm just telling you, you gotta be so careful about being in the sun. You cannot be too careful. So that's a really good bit of advice. You're from where now? Cedar Rapids, Iowa. I'm originally from Terrell, Iowa, in the Lake Okoboji area of Northwest Iowa, and I'm also a proud 1974 graduate of the University of South Dakota here. So, gee, yeah, we're at the University of South Dakota, and gee, that's where we met, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I, was, I'm, I'm happy to be here. I looked up to all you guys going to college was, here. So you were in what fraternity, may I remember? Lambda Chi Alpha. Lambda Chi Alpha, and we're happy to have a reunion tonight, uh, this week, so that's a great deal. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. Louis. Uh, tell us a little bit about you, too. Before you say that, though, let's hear your advice for people. I think the, the number one advice is staying out of tanning booths. Uh, I was driving down from Rapid City today and trying to find a station where you could hear something, and I heard this big ad for tanning booths, and what they were promoting is you'd get, uh, for every minute that you bought, you got an extra minute. So it was basically half price for a tanning booth which in, in, is the same way with the sun, is stay out of tanning booths. It, it just makes, makes trouble. Yeah. So you're from uh, where originally? Originally from Gregory, South Dakota, and went to uh, the first uh, undergrad here at University of South Dakota, first two years of medical school here, and then graduated Brown, and did my family medicine residency in Sioux Falls, practiced in Gregory for 10 years, and then I had a little diversion. I spent 26 years in San Diego. Just a slight yeah, uh, yeah, part yeah, there, and yeah. then you came home. I came home. I've been back in, uh, I live uh, in the in Black Hills. I've been there for about a year, and I'm the vice president of, of uh, physician services with regional health. And, and when you were undergrad at, at USD, and when you were in med school at USD, you were my classmate the whole six yes. years together. Yeah. And then you went to Brown, I went to Emory. What a great joy. And uh, were you in a fraternity? 
I was also in Lambda Chi Alpha. Oh, you yes. were in Lambda yeah. Chi Alpha. Yeah. And yeah. what's happening with Lambda Chi Alpha this weekend? Well, they're having a 100th anniversary of the uh, chapter here at uh, uh, USD. Wow. So that's very interesting. Yeah. Thank you for joining it. You bet. Jim McGran, you're, uh, you're, from, you're, in, you're from where? Sioux Falls. You've crazy been, place. You've been on the show for a long time. So you'd think yeah. I'd remember that. Yeah, it's crazy stuff. Yeah. yeah. So you went, to, where did you go? Well, I'm a Watertown native, and amazingly, I went to the University of South Dakota, and I was in that fraternity, Lambda Chi Alpha, as well. Oh, wow. I trained at uh, University of Wisconsin as a dermatologist and a fellow in uh, Mohs surgery, and I've been back in Sioux Falls for the last, well, let's see, they were still making dirt when I got here. Were they? Um, <laughs> um, 35 years. Yeah. So uh, you did, you were like the first... Yeah, uh, Moe's surgeon in South Dakota, were you not? Yes. And that's really changed. I mean, right now it's really kind of standard therapy for many kinds of cancers. Well, uh, the wonderful thing is that uh, you don't have to travel too far to get great care in this day and age. Rapid City has now several outstanding physicians. Uh, Pure is getting one. Uh, we have a number here in Sioux Falls, and so I tell people you have the luxury of having great options wherever you go. That's great. Well, we've got some uh, different uh, format for tonight. We're going to run through some slides that Jim was happy to send me. 60 slides. We cut it down to 30, and we're going to um, uh, start. But first, we're going to start with uh, decubitus ulcers, uh, because that is one of the major problems that we see in nursing homes, for in particular, are people who are debilitated. Um, and now we have the picture of the, the four characteristics of of, uh, of cancer, of malignant melanoma, or skin lesions. Uh, let's go through that one, one by one. We've, we've done decubitus ulcers. We know that they, you can have redness, you can have blister, and then it goes through the skin slightly, and then it goes way in. So those are the levels of severity of pressure ulcers that we need to avoid. But let's go to the next Rick, slide. Are those also called pressure sores? They are called pressure sores. Okay. And we see them, we can see them in anybody who's debilitated and doesn't know to push up off the chair and get the pressure off their, their bottom. Let's take that first slide now. Uh, what do you see there? Louis? Well, I see uh, three separate, well, there are several lesions here, but uh, the largest lesion or uh, on the skin is a uh, red, we would called erythematous uh, lesion. Uh, it's formed a papule, it's ulcerated, uh, and then you have two uh, uh, s satellite lesions uh, on the right side of that lesion. I was thinking it has a roll border like basal cell cancer. Now you guys pop right in. What do you think? Well, I've, I've, I, basal cell, you think of any type of cancer, you don't usually see four of them kind of grouped together like that. So I, I, you think it's something inflammatory too, is, uh, where the skin's very inflamed as maybe a reaction to an underlying illness. All right. Jim. Well, you know, this is one of those things where when you're taking your boards, they give you a picture like this and say, well, what am I thinking? Well, yeah. a good doctor doesn't look just at one spot. They look at the whole skin surface, they assess the process that's going on, and then they come back to the anatomy and say, well, what are the possibilities? So in a lesion like this, we need a differential. So could be a tumor, could be a blistering disease. The answer is you need a biopsy. Yeah, right. And history is important. Right. Excellent. This is interesting. I was thinking... Uh, the malignant, uh, lentigo maligna that you see people have on the temple, but it could be a bruise or something like that. Well, it, it could be. That'd be pretty extensive. But, and your point about uh, a melanoma or some tumor like that, I, I'm not sure I've ever seen it that widespread, so I might think of another less, type of tumor. Less likely. Right. Next slide. This is a straightforward one. This is what in dermatology we call a door exam. That you're standing at the door and saying yeah. you have, and herpes simplex. Yeah. So, uh, it's herpes simplex. Could it be herpes zoster? Of I course. Mean, shingles? Absolutely. Herpes zoster all well, about yeah. history. Yeah. All about presentation. Yeah. And herpes looks. zoster also called shingles. Right. Right. Yeah. Let's go back to the shingles picture. I mean, you see the, the bliss, the tiny little blisters. I guess they're not. Uh, all together in a cluster. If you see it in the sh uh, wrapping itself around up to halfway around, you know that's a that's a disaster. That's because yeah. usually follows a nerve. But it's a cold sore if it's near the lip. Next, this is a breast. What what the the what's the classic peau de range mean? 
John? I think it just means that the, the, it's the kind of the color of the skin that means the, the orange and then it's uh, edematous and, sw and swollen. It gives you that kind of dimpled look too. Yeah, From, it, it's the, the orange peel. The orange it's peel. It's the, the peel of the orange. And so that's why it has that, that's, it's called that because it almost looks like an orange peel type consistency. And the diagnosis is, Jim? Well, it's probably Paget's disease, um, but there could be other things like a mastocytosis. And so this is one where, again, differential is the issue, history is an issue, as, as Lou mentioned. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a picture where, again, when you look at this, you have to come up with a differential, but it's probably Paget's disease. Which is which a is kind of cancer. A, usually associated with in situ uh, breast cancer. Yeah, next slide. We're ready. And that's the rash of the hand. It could be a burn, I suppose. A burn? Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, again, I mean, history is very important. It could be a contact dermatitis. This, right. this person could have their hands in <clears throat> different chemicals and that sort of thing. It could be something to do with the sun, too. It just looks like it stops right at kind of the, mm -hmm. the middle part of the finger. Okay. Lupus, porphyria, the number of... Number porphyria of is an interesting one, then, on the next slide patch of uh, dermatitis that's scaly. I saw that to this week on a friend who I think is the classic Scotch-Irish light skin, mm -hmm. too much hot showers, too much soap, dry, dry, dry skin. But and what? two percent of us have psoriasis and that's also a possibility. Yeah. John? No, I think it's an eczema, maybe a numular eczema, which means it's round, Latin for round shape yeah. or coin shape. Yeah. yeah. So how would you treat that, John? Well, usually people are over bathing, and so you got you got to cut down on their showers. That if I usually I would do a scraping first to make sure it's not a fungus, right. and it's a simple test. Look at it on the microscope. If that was negative, then I'd probably give them some topical steroids and tell them to start l using moisturizing lotions on their skin a lot yeah. more. Cera V, Cera V, Cera V. Yeah. After the shower. <clears throat> okay, this is uh, a blistery kind of a rash on the hands, circular area on the thumb there. Um, what do you think? I, I think there, there's a, the disease called dyshydrotic dermatitis. I think that's one thing. That's where you get a lot, lots of little water-filled blisters on the hands. And again, history is important. Usually it itches like crazy. Yeah, it's on so the size I mean, of the fingers. But what's the cause of that? I mean, what? No one really knows. It, some people, it's, it's seasonal and it just you have pops to use, up. You have to use powerful steroids, though, steroid ointments. Right. And, yeah. right. and you have to really avoid any kind of irritating solutions, strong soaps. Uh, uh, you'll find raw vegetables, raw meats. Anything that defats the skin can exacerbate these things. Okay. Next so slide. being a hairstylist with this condition wouldn't be, be good. Yeah, bad. No, Get it done. Another job. Next slide. Okay, Jim. Well, this is what they call Putz Jaeger, and uh, this is something that as a dermatologist say, this is what it is, go see Rick Holm. Yeah, because <laughs> they have these same vascular blisters that are lining the GI tract, and they can oftentimes present with blood, and you don't do anything except that you know that it's not cancer. That's the thing, and it comes in fam familial, so it's hereditary hem hemorrhagic telangiectasia is the fancy word for oh, it. No, this Go ahead. This, yeah. No. <laughs> well, no, this is a little bit different than that. Than that. that these are the Pusch Jaggers. Is, yeah, this is a little does run with pigmented cancer. areas, and it could could have an underlying cancer of the gastrointestinal tract. All right. So Pusch Jaggers has yeah. the cancer. So these people could sometimes they could lose blood from their GI tract. Right. They right. Become anemic. And yeah. That sort Absolutely. Of thing. You need to have a scope. Yeah. That's usually how you find out about it. Yeah. That's what I was going to say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is a. Uh, it almost looks like. A, a uh, warty growth on the lips uh, and uh, big tongue, differential for a big tongue? Well, it can be vitamin or arrive. Uh, B12 in B12, particular. Uh, certain essential amino acids. Uh, but you look at the patient and you have to say, well, how healthy is it? This could also be a person with AIDS and these granulomatous lesions could be any number of atypical uh, infectious agents. We see a lot of people with chylosis or this mm -hmm. irritation mm -hmm. of the lips from Try. Well, a lot of that's aging. You know, as people get older, we start to get a little traction going here, and gravity pulls that down and creates a crease. It begins to be moist constantly, and it's yeah. a nice place for uh, yeast to grow. Uh, and moisture, irritation. Yep. Right. Uh, that's a weird one. It looks like impetigo to me, but you guys went on and on as we kind of went through these earlier. What would you call it quick, John? Well, this would be, be adenoma sebation would be the what those little papules or bumps are, Rick, but it goes along with it. Uh, 
something called tuberous sclerosis, which is an inherited problem, okay. disease. Uh, but impetigo is something a lot of kids will have, and you treat, yeah. what do you treat impetigo with? Well, usually it's oral antibiotics or topical antibiotics because it's either okay. staph or strep. Right? Okay, yep. yeah. Right. We have a question, let's just finish this off. Uh, I think that the person might have a, an, a, a sepsis, an infection, little blebs of infection are flipping off the heart valve and hitting the tongue, but there's other things. Jim? Could be something as simple as eating a really hot food. It can, it can injure the tongue. Also it could be related, these could be vascular, so those could be little uh, cholangiectasia type lesions, that uh, ataxia cholangiectasia and some other conditions related. Right. Um, so uh, here, biopsy. Right. Next slide. And this is a severe infection in glossitis. It could be infections in the tongue. Next slide. This is an interesting one, uh, uh, Louis. Well, yeah, you have multiple lesions on this patient, and and you know if you know you think about the conditions like tuberous sclerosis and things like that. Right. Or John. And, and these are neurofibroma, you know, neurofibromatosis. Yep. And this is the von Recklinghausen, and, and uh, a disease that's not rare in South Dakota. Uh, I see, we, we, I've we seen see numbers of von Recklinghausen. Now, this is an extreme case, but it's not unusual for people to show up with this. And there are 12 different kinds of neurofibromatosis. And so types 1 and 2 are fairly common in this state, and they'll often present fairly asymmetric, asymptoms. And here's the elephant man who they say had... Uh, uh, von Recklinghausen's neurofibromatosis, but uh, maybe he didn't, is what you're telling me. Well, they're starting to come up with some other theories on that, and I think at this point, they're theories. You okay. know? Nobody Next. knows for sure. Next slide. And this could be a million things. Next slide. And this is stasis of the legs. Any comments? The, the important. Well, my first thought is that sometimes with uh, people who have low thyroid can get these thickened changes on their legs. It can be other things, but right. that'd be a common thing on their. Sh this is on the shins of a patient. And it's in, and this patient's had it for a while uh, uh, because you've got hemocytic, you've got staining deposits there. Yep. So this isn't something that's come on just in the last few days. This right. is something the patients had for weeks or months. This is a great case of what, Jim? Scleroderma. Uh, so they they talk about the. Uh, the sclerosing process. This is a late stage of uh, a, uh, uh, one of these diseases that's a metabolic disease, and uh, unfortunately, this has advanced to a, a severe, severe state. And there's not much we can do for it. Either. Not once they get this far. This is a, uh, a distal. I mean, it's at the la last parts of the fingers, kind of a dermatitis. What do you think, John? Uh, it, could, it could be somebody that's work that stain it from working some chemicals could be a smoker too got outside and could be frostbite frostbite, frostbite yeah. i think well that's you it. know in dermatology if you don't know what something is you give it a beautiful name so we would call this distal dactylitis very impressive yeah. and then hope they don't ask what it what means. is <laughs> this is what louis i'm not sure i'd probably call my local dermatologist to be honest <laughs> okay you. Well, and the key thing is diffuse purpura. Yeah. So we're looking at probably something that's a palpable purpura, and in dermatology, we're always taught palpable purpura, think infection. Right. So uh, meningitis, Neisseria meningitis type of things yeah. like that. It could um, be a reaction to other underlying illnesses, drugs you too. You know. Right. It's usually, it's a reactional state. This, this is a blister type of an illness, erythema multiforme. I guess I'm getting word that we should. It's usually blister though. Well, it, it, targety. Target yeah. lesions. Yeah, target lesions, different shapes and sizes. Yeah, uh, it's in internal malignancy. My producer just said, let's go to the questions. All right. 62-year-old uh, woman from Aberdeen, how do we treat thin skin due to low estrogen after menopause when thin gets very skin, the, the skin gets very thin in, in the vaginal area? Well, they, there are topical estrogens that you can use. Oral estrogens have fallen out of favor, uh, but they are starting to come back a little bit. There's a lot of research in that. Uh, we tend to start out with the basics, and that is avoid strong cleansers, no soaps, no detergents. We often tell people best way to clean, water, uh, and then light lubricants, unscented. Uh, that's probably, right. uh, John, you may have some other no, ideas. That, that, estrogen creams. 
and and then mm -hmm. the estrogen creams because yep. you got to build that tissue back up, yep. and right. an estrogen cream will help do that. That's probably the most prescribed thing my GYN doctor prescribes my my female patients with vaginitis or irritations yep. down there. I have had this redness on my face for months. I have tried Nystatin, Athlete's Foot Cream, and Steroid Cream. What's on my face, and how can I get it to go away? Redness on my face for months. Ooh. Could be a number of things that you might want. If it's tried some antifungals, anti-yeast medicines, and steroids, and well, maybe it's something inflammatory like a rosacea. Right. Could, or well, and then the other thing that happens too. I've seen patients. They'll come in. They've been self-treating these. And sometimes they're using neosporin and different products and like that. And you're allergic that. to the neosporin. And they develop a sensitivity, so the, the redness continues because of the product they've been using. Right. Or they could have lupus, for example. I mean, yes, you, you need to get in. Mm -hmm. Be seen probably by a skin expert, yes. I would say. 84-year-old woman from Sioux Falls asks about her 12-year-old granddaughter. Does a rash with bumps all over the body come from a virus? Or is it a food allergy? She's next to someone with a cold when the rash broke out. Could that have something to do with it? So a 12-year-old granddaughter, rash with bumps all over the body, body come from well, food allergy? Well, timing is your whole answer here. If it's a food-related allergy, it will occur within a certain period of time. Uh, a lot of these are IgE-mediated. You take it, and within minutes, you've got a rash. Now, if it's related to a virus, it's there and it stays. And so history, history, history. Okay. Uh, 74 year old John you want to add to that no I just think it, again it depends on how long they've had it and that sort of thing it, it could be something infectious or contagious too so it, right it yeah, needs to be checked out there, there, yep. there's too much possible causes so, too many 74 year old woman from Yankton I have adult acne could you touch on that subject what are the best treatments for my age I'm not sure if rosacea or not but I would just like some more information so uh, Adolescent acne is called acne vulgaris. Adult acne is called acne rosacea. What, what is the cause of, what's the difference? Well, there, there, there actually is an adult acne too that's uh, based on an excess of a chemical in the skin called androstenedione. dione. Um, and those individuals, unfortunately, will have acne their whole life. And the, the new studies suggest now that uh, an, uh, androgen blocking agents, something like uh, uh, one of the, uh, well, the, some of the birth control, spironolactone or drosperinone, which is in one of the birth control pills for younger people would be mm -hmm. acceptable. Um, and so Mayo Clinic has actually developed a women's division and they're starting to look at this in great detail. Rosacea, of course, is also in that area, but rosacea is more of an environmental uh, effect that relates to sunlight and predispositions. And so there, there are two entities that can occur in that age group. Okay. And unfortunately, rosacea gets called acne rosacea, so people think it's one of the same when it's not. But you yeah. treat it there pretty are some, close to the same as you do with Some chop. similarities because some of the oral antibiotics are similar. The topical medicines are very different because they're more anti-inflammatory. So what, a topical for uh, an adolescent would be? Well, usually benzoyl peroxide or something called Retin-A. Those are the more common topical medicines. For, for an adult? But well, they, if an adult has acne, they'd use that too. But for somebody who has rosacea, then it's more some, something called azelaic acid or metronidazole would be common things. All right. Ivermectin now. Ivermectin's a new one. Mm -hmm. I, a uh, 64 year old from Mitchell, I have spots on my back that are brown and turn into a scab like thing, and I want to ask about them. Spots on the back that are brown and turn into scabs. You've just left the Pepsi generation. Oh, is that? <laughs> these are, these are seborrheic keratosis in all likelihood. Um, yeah. Seems to be related to a hormone in the bowel called epidermal growth factor. And as we get older, uh, it's sort of 85% of us are going to get these. They are benign. They don't require treatment. But many times we do treat them because they have, they're not elegant and they can be a nuisance. And they, they itch. Yeah. Well, the, the, the challenge is you'll see some patients, though, they'll have hundreds of these right. on their back. And so then treating them gets to the point where, you know, it's almost a why bother. You know? Right. It's not yeah. cost effective. Now, yeah, John mentioned something we were talking earlier about when these occur in certain fashion. So we're, you mentioned that. Well, yeah. the lesser trelate. Right. Well, there's a, it's pretty unusual, but it's called the sign of a lesser trelate. I may be pronouncing it wrong, but it's where you rapidly get these rough, I call them warty-like lesions, all over your body within a few months. And oftentimes that's due to an underlying 
uh, cancer, usually of the gastrointestinal tract. Right. But I've only seen one case of that. Well, let's say Trillet or whatever, right, however yeah. you mm -hmm. pronounce it. Louis, do you, have you, as practicing family physician, have you seen internal malignancies present in a dermatologic fashion in your history? Uh, uh, not so much, although I've seen uh, patients who will, uh, uh, it's not so much in the skin, but they'll get a, a blood clot. They'll, they'll get blood clots and weird things and blood vessels under their skin due to, for example, lung cancer. And I've seen that be the first sign of a lung cancer uh, in a patient where they get these, this phlebitis. They come in with red area and what they've got is a blood clot in the, in the vein under the skin and it's a, their first sign of lung cancer. Well, well there's a lot of, uh, of uh, phlebitis and, and clotting that can be triggered by hyper coagulable state. coagulable state that comes after certain cancers. Mm -hmm. When a section of your skin is subjected to repeated pressure or abrasion, it begins to react. That reaction can be painful and potentially damaging to the area in question. Well, a decubitus ulcer is commonly called a pressure ulcer or a bed sore. Um, National Pressure Ulcer Advisory Panel um, classifies it as a localized injury to the skin or the underlying tissue over a bony prominence as a result of a pressure or pressure in combination with friction or shear. Bony prominences are anywhere on your body that you have a bone fairly close to the surface, such as your hips, your elbows, your knees, your ankles, your heels, um, your spine, your buttocks, if you're laying on your back, um, your tops of your ears, even though that's not a bone, can be very prone to pressure as well. There are four stages that are actually staged. To stage one is just a redness of the skin that does not blanch. When you push your finger on it, it doesn't turn white and then turn pink again, it just stays red. A stage two is a shallow ulceration. Some tissue loss, usually not very deep, usually very shallow, very superficial, but there is tissue gone. A stage three is more involved into the subcutaneous and dermis of the skin. Um, can even be down to the muscles sometimes, depending on what bony prominence it is, because obviously over the nose is a lot shallower skin than over, say, over the hip or the knee or the buttock. A stage four usually involves muscle and bone is visible. There's also one that's called an unstageable, and that is where there's eschar covering the surface of the wound or slough or a big scab for lay people that's covering the surface of the wound and we can't see what's underneath that wound. So we call those an unstageable. Another one that they use is called a deep tissue injury and that's a purpling. It looks like a bruise. It starts as a bruise, but it's over a bony prominence. Not just a bruise in the middle of your thigh, but a bruise on your knee or on your heel or on your hip or your buttock where it would be a bony prominence that's causing tissue underneath. Those are typically caused by shear. Um, friction and shear are two other main causes of decubitus ulcers other than pressure. Pressure itself is probably the primary number one reason. Friction is just the force of dragging skin or dragging a person up in bed or shifting themselves out of a couch or a chair to get up, not using the lift mechanism of their lift chair and scooting themselves out. Um, and that's just that surface abrasion, looks like a rug burn, what people would call a rug burn, or looks like just a tiny little bruise or burn to the skin. Shear is actually underneath the surface of the skin. It's where the epidermis and dermis kind of separate and the two separate so maybe the pelvic bone will go one direction but the skin goes another direction. And that's internal. It's not visible on the surface of the skin but it's one of the primary causes for deep tissue injuries and pressure ulcers. Quicker the treatment the better. Um, if it's not something that you think you can take care of yourself, definitely seek assistance from your primary care provider. Sometimes it results in a referral to me. We can look at all of our options as far as what do we need to use for wound healing? What do we need to do to reduce pressure? Do we need to do that pressure mapping? Moisturization of their skin, again, I can't stress that enough as far as internally taking enough liquids during the course of the day for hydration and applying some type of moisturizer on a regular basis. Frequent skin assessments, if you have a loved one that's somewhat immobile, um, someone that's not able to check themselves, it's, you know, you can't see your own bottom, so it's hard to tell, um, but just frequent, frequent assessments to make sure that things are doing okay.
So that really speaks to quality. I mean, that's what you had said earlier, Louis. We're talking quality, and I know that in nursing homes, as a medical director of a nursing home, they are the bane of our existence. We don't want to have uh, ulcers that represent not getting enough nurse, good nursing care. Of course, no matter how you do it, 2 to 20% of them are going to get ulcers. Why, why would they get ulcers? Well, because they're not moving, and they're, they're staying in one spot for prolonged periods of time. Either they're lying on their back for prolonged periods of time or on their side for long ter periods of time, and that pressure on the skin causes breakdown of the skin, and, and you, you get the different stages of those pressures are also just like they talked about. Uh, so that's one of the keys is if you have a patient that can, is not mobile, is turning that patient. And so most nursing homes, most of the physicians will write an order to turn the patient or the nursing care plan will turn that patient every so many, uh, like every 15 minutes or every half hour or that sort of thing. And then it's just good skin care. Uh, it's keeping the skin clean, keeping it well dry. moisturized, keeping it dry, making sure people are not in those sacral, those, those ulcers that people get on their buttocks, uh, making sure that they're not uh, incontinent of stool and they're incontinent of urine and that you keep them clean and dry. Right, there you go. Uh, any additions to that point? I, it, it's a measurement of quality, but I don't care how wonderful your nursing home is and no matter how many times you turn them, if they're malnourished, they're gonna break down like nobody's business. There's just, there's just so many factors, you know, the, the, the malnourishment, you know, and, and so many of these patients are incontinent and it's kind of like a little baby. You, you can't be there fast enough to ch clean them often enough. Right. And it's just not patients in nursing homes. You have people who have had either traumatic injuries, they're you know, paraplegics, they're, their legs are paralyzed, or they're quadriplegics, and sometimes they're living at home. Uh, right. And so that good skin care is, a, is, is just as important in the home for those patients as it is for the nursing home patients or patients in hospital. I have a nephew who's a total quad from a bike accident in college, and he moves in his, his chair by blowing on a straw. Mm -hmm. But when you're hanging with him, he'll crank that thing up and move it around and shift himself uh, around and has no problems because of the wonderful care he's been taught to do. Jim, you have any addition? You guys nailed it. Number one, nutrition. Number two, skin care. That's yeah. it. Here we go. Well, we've got questions, and, and, I, and my question monitor just uh, pooped out. Any, any other further uh, comments about it? We nailed it. So here we go. I gave the wrong deal, 9-3. So the next question is, uh, a, would you describe what happens that uh, seems to separate the upper layer of skin from the layer beneath when you take a lot of prednisone. So what happens with a person who takes a fair amount of prednisone, Jim? Well, they're prone to bruising, and the, the skin doesn't really separate, but um, when you take large doses of uh, prednisone, the, the blood vessels become more fragile, they're more likely to, to uh, bleed underneath, and so what we're typically seeing are not blisters, we're seeing purpura, which is bleeding under the skin. Which is bruises. Yeah. And that's the prednisone. Yeah. Boy, they come in with bruises all over their forearms. And I say, okay, are you taking your baby aspirin? Well, there it is. And you're on a little steroid for your polymyalgia rheumatica. There it is. And are you doing fine otherwise? Yep, I'm doing fine. Don't worry about it. The only one as a dermatologist that I'd look at is after we've taken that history, if there's no answer, then I do a biopsy. Because occasionally we're going to see systemic disease. Well, and you want to look at... I'm sorry. And then, and then you get a history. What medications have they been taking? Are they taking quinine? Uh, I mean, I've seen some very interesting things from people that are taking various medications aside from prednisone or uh, people self-medicating uh, for muscle cramps with quinine. Yeah. I've seen people who have the first sign of it is, uh, is their bone marrow disease and they have platelets that are way yeah. low and, or they're on warfarin or one of the platelet agents. And, of course, most, most people, if it happens just on their forearms and hands, just as we get older, we're on aspirin and things like that, and we bump it, and it, all of a sudden you got yeah. a bruise. Don't even remember the bump, you know? Yeah. Don't remember. Yeah. That's just, you get it's fragile when you get older. Senile purpura. Right. That's the term. Well, right. who, what's senile? Is that older than, uh, <laughs> how old? Yeah. It's, it's getting older now. A <laughs> 66-year-old you know, uh, woman from Mitchell had the shingle shot, 60 years old, uh, Six years ago, a few weeks ago, she had a slight case of shingles, was treated for it. It's common to contract shingles after you've had the vaccination, Louie? 
Yeah, there's, it, it only decreases the incidence of shingles about 50 percent. So the, it's it, and usually when you get it, it's not as severe and hopefully cuts down on the problem that a lot of shingles patients have, which is post-herpetic neuralgia, which is? which is a chronic, severe pain that is very, very difficult to treat. So how many here in the room have had their shingle shot? Oh, <laughs> you're too young yet. Yeah, too no, young. No, I'm not. I need to get it. Thanks for reminding me. Yeah, yeah. I couldn't emphasize enough the importance of getting the shingle shot. Yeah. It's, uh, Which, it, and it is mandated by insurance now. Our, the federal government mandates that insurance companies cover it. Yep. All right. Would you describe what happens that seems to separate the, oh, we asked that. Man from Yankton prescribed anti-inflammatory gel for right hand swelling is wondering what's the correct amount of gel to apply to the skin with a wrap to avoid drying and thinning the skin? Well, yeah. what I tell patients uh, all the time in our age group, I say, uh, oh, you remember Burl Cream? A little dab will do you. Most medications that you apply topically, you just need a small amount, just yep. barely, not, otherwise you're wasting it. A little dab will do you. Maybe one of the greatest marketing slogans ever. Probably was, wasn't it? <laughs> Burl Cream. And of course, don't you remember the signs on the roads? You know, kind of another Burl, Burl Cream. cream. Signs, yeah. 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 A uh, 73-year-old man from Sioux Falls, caller has infantigo, impetigo. Uh, let's talk about infantigo or impetigo. It's a condition where you have white spot lesions on the body, has three doctors given him three different reasons why it's happened. None were 100% sure. All three doctors were, uh, uh, were with the Veterans Administration and haven't done anything to help with the symptoms. Do the doctors have any ideas as to what causes it? and if there is a cure. So impetigo, does it sound like it's man has impetigo? Yeah. Poss does, possibly, possibly not. Well, let's let's talk some, about impetigo. The right. skin breaks down, you're exposed to a pathogen. That's impetigo. A bug, a bug yeah. bacteria. But, you know, is it quite possible he doesn't have that? Sure. It's possible he still ha he does have it, so I guess it, in this day and age, if it keeps coming back, I would culture it to see if it's like MRSA or one of those, you know, resistant, resistant staph things, or you might want to think about culture in his, no his nose. Could yeah. be a carrier staph. I think sometimes we infect ourselves that yeah. way. Well, and if this is always coming, if it's always coming back in the same spot, you know, then maybe think about a biopsy. Yeah, because it could be something else. You yes. Know. Well, you have to remember that there's a typical, about 20% of people that get herpes simplex will have a secondary yeah. staph overgrowth. Yeah. Could, so could it could be, could be herpes. both. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, if it's coming back in the same spot as loose. Mm -hmm. And there is nothing called infantigo. It's called impetigo. Impetigo, yes. Of course, infants can get it, but that's... 83-year-old mm -hmm. woman from Rock Valley, Iowa. How far from your home? Yeah, probably about an hour. Which way? Um, it would be west, okay. closer to the South Dakota border. She puts Vaseline on after she showers and seems to have nice skin because of it. How effective is this for the general population? Is Vaseline good lotion to use should you put it in on the shower, after the shower? I think Vaseline is the best thing you, c you can yeah. use. It's, Probably. It, it's pure. It's a pure grease and it's uh, hardly any preservatives or anything in there that you would react to. It's just that most people find it a little too heavy or greasy. But if you don't mind it, I think it's great. Yeah, I think it's great. And I think putting it on right after the shower when your skin's still kind of damp and supple is an excellent way to do it. Yeah. It, it's inexpensive. It works. You can't be allergic to it. Uh, you just can overuse it. So it's like John said, a little dab will do you. Mm -hmm. I like the idea of using it on an open wound to keep the wound from drying out instead of Bacter, uh, Bacterban or Bacitracin or triple antibiotic because the that studies show that Vaseline works just as well as the other three, except the other three develop allergies. Right. And the Vaseline, yeah. you don't get an allergy. So it's, we got four yeses on that one. Yeah. <laughs> so Keep it up. Good job. 75-year-old uh, woman from Rapid City, question, granddaughter visited recently, sophomore in college with orange discoloration in the tongue, tried baking soda, but it didn't work. What now? Stop the orange pop. Orange pop. <laughs> I, uh, any other thoughts? Maybe Orange she, tongue. I. But she may have uh, been on some antibiotics. Maybe it's some overgrowth of yeast and bacteria too. Something you know, like the so-called black hairy tongue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, black hairy tongue. Weird things. There's viral things that could happen too. Yeah, Louis. No, I mean, if, if, uh, if she had other things turning orange, as the rest of her skin is turning orange, I wondered if she's 
uh, overdoing on the carrots uh, and, and that sort of thing. Yeah. So that was a great answer. I was my answer. I had a I was at a teaching hospital and the, the as the attending of the outpatient clinic and the a r intern run, ran in and said, "Doctor Holm, come. I've got a guy. I think he's his liver's failing. He's got he's 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 got uh, orange color of liver failure, you know." And I went up to him and I looked at him and he was orange as could be. And I looked at his eyes and they were white yeah. and beautiful. And I said, so are you drinking a lot of carrot juice? And he said, yeah, I've been got into a new machine and makes carrot juice and I've been eating carrots like crazy. Uh, Carotemia. Yep. Yeah. One of, the, one of the things with the tongue, though, is that, you know, you look at it and say, if it's only the tongue, yeah. take a scraping and see what's there, because the vast majority of the time, it's going to be food or drink. You know, I mean, uh, an orange tongue is not pathognomonic of any particular disease. Okay. 88-year-old woman from here, and what is actinic keratosis? John. That's just the medical word for a pre-skin cancer. And it's from? Sun damage, those are usually a little red, kind of scaly things we get on most of the sun exposed areas of our body, head, yeah. neck, arms, and each little spot has about a 10% lifetime risk of being a type of skin cancer. Yeah. Scaly areas on red, red-headed, blonde people in particular. Pink, pink and crusty feels like sandpaper, come and see us. Right. Uh, I got a question, is spray sunscreen as good as cream sunscreen? You know, you can do the spray stuff, and you can make sure that you get it on, and you guys will be willing to put that on and not put the cream stuff. You know, you know in this day and age, we're happy to have them use it any way we can get yeah. it. So, <laughs> so, you know, if it's a guy, you're more likely to get it. And, and I confess, I'm a spray guy. Uh, my wife is a cream person, and a lot of it relates to who you are and what you like. Um, I just say, if you're going to use it, that's great. Uh, often I'll suggest if you spray that you take a cloth or something and rub it in to make sure you don't miss anything. I think the other important thing, too, is the, reapp the need for reapplication. If somebody's spending the day at the beach or, you know, the day doing something, they're going to have to reapply the sunscreen, I don't know, what, every couple hours or something yeah, like that. I mean, how intense it is, yeah, yeah. For it to be effective. I love the time you told me. I, this was off camera sometime years ago. We were talking about how you know, sitting under a shady tree on a sunny day at the lake, broad-brimmed hat, and you know, long sleeve shirt, and and well protected. Doesn't like to use sunscreen. And you told, and uh, it was a cl actually it was a cloudy day, mm -hmm. and you said the clouds mean that there was a sun protective factor two at the most. The broad-brimmed hat, the tree. That person's like uh, spending a day in, in sun protective factor three or mm -hmm. four at the very best. It's not, an, uh, did I miss? Well, even, even in a cloudy day, 80% of the UV light gets through. So the concept that there's no sun, I don't have to worry about it, doesn't cut. And, and you remember, sun bounces. So uh, if you're in a snow-covered area, it reflects off the sun when you're skiing, reflects off the water in the summer. And so, you know, yes, the hat's good, the clothing's good, sunscreen's also part of the equation. It's not just one thing. It's usually different things that, for total protection. Use the sunscreen. Use the sunscreen. What's the best product for me to use for black spots, dark age spots on my face? I haven't found one cover-up that works, and I don't want to just try to hide it. I want to get rid of it. It just keeps growing and spreading. I sometimes cryo those. What do you guys do? Well, cryo means freezing. Freeze them. It, you know, and you can do that. My only problem with that is that it sometimes leaves these big white spots. White right. spots. Kind of scarring, and then it's like, what's more noticeable, you know? Uh, people are lasering them can, off now. You can cover that, though, with a little makeup but the black spots aren't coverable. Yeah, it's hard, but sometimes you get a makeup that, that's close to that and you kind of blend it all in. All right, so so, but they're there. benign. Well, not always. I mean, it's a sign of sun damage. I mean, they're, you might call them in layperson's terms, sun freckles, or, yeah. but they, they can turn into a type Cancer. of low-grade melanoma. Yeah. And so you've got to be, the usual things about does it, get, does it look dark and irregular. Uh, I'm from Aberdeen, a 47-year-old woman, had regional rashes for 10 years, prescribed every kind of topical ointment, had no relief, region may be my lower arm or my thigh region, for example, the area is extremely itchy and the area can turn into blood blisters after scratching, the rash is somewhat raised, irregular in shape will cover a large area, I've had biopsies, 
And those have come back without definite answers, just a type of dermatitis. Was put on methyltrexate, didn't help. The only thing that seems to help is cortisone shots. Well, you know, this patient's not necessarily a skin disease. It could be, you have to look at it and say, well, perhaps it's urticaria. So it's the old, is it the chicken or the egg, you know? Right. So why does she have these rash? Well, because she's scratching. Why does she scratch? Because she itches. Why does she itch? Because she has hives. Um, there's something called dermatographism, and that's a condition that you don't treat with steroids. You don't treat with the methotrexate in most cases. Uh, you're going to treat with an antihistamine or some type of an agent to block that. And so that's, that's a question. case where she really needs to sit down with a good medical dermatologist. All right. Now we're going to go back to what we kind of touched base earlier, detecting skin cancer. It's a vital, important thing. We have some pictures that represent the five phases of diagnosis, A, B, C, D, and E. A is asymmetry. Uh, what are we talking about asymmetry here? Well, yeah, it's, it's, not a, it's not a uniform circle. It's asymmetry. It bulges out, the lesion bulges out on one side, and it's not symmetrical. Okay. Border, John? That just means that usually around the outside of the mole or the skin lesion should be nice and kind of a crisp line, not, not chopped up or anything. Or, or hazy or fuzzy. No. So a border sharp needs to be and sharp, crisp. and if it isn't, it's abnormal, huh? It C, could be. C, it should be sharp, we want it. Well, and the color, but they're really what we're talking about is symmetry, and you know, does this, is there variegated color? So a normal mole may be dark in the center and light at the edges, or light in the center, dark at the edge, but if you see multiple colors, blacks, browns, whites, uh, changes, the variegated color, very worrisome. Very worrisome. D is diameter. So what's the size we start to worry about? Louis well, or John? What they usually say the si it should be no bigger than the size of a pencil eraser. but Which is 7 millimeters. 6 mm -hmm. to 7 millimeters, yeah. yeah. So you guys agree with that? No. What do you say, yeah, Jenner? No, I look at the patient. Uh, I've taken melanomas off that are 2 millimeters, and I've seen benign lesions that are several centimeters. You have to look at the patient. And we use something called dioscopy, which is a tool that doctors now use to look with magnification. And those patterns can give you great, meaningful information. And really quickly, E means evolving. You, yeah, and I, and I think to, that goes to, the to Jim's point, I think, I think the D is probably the, the least helpful of all the signs for me because, again, yep. they can be yeah. different. So if E is evolving. Is it changing? Is right. it getting bigger? Does right. it stand out from the others? All right. And now for to the winner of tonight's Prairie Doc quiz question. Fill in the blank in the upper prairie mid portion of our country, especially in the winter. The most common cause for a rash is, gentlemen? Dry, dry, dry skin. skin. <laughs> so we got it in unison there. Three dry skin, three. it's called cool. winner's itch. It was Louise Stapert from Aberdeen who answered the question correctly. Thank you, Louise, for participating. And a book will be in the mail to you soon. Let's talk about dry skin, most common problem that we see. Quick treatment. Stay away from strong soap. Yeah. Light moisturizers. Most people are over bathing in the winter. They're taking their 10, 15 minute shower with their deodorant soap like Dial or Zest. And, and hot, 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 hot shower. Hot, hot showers and you can't figure out why they're so itchy and stuff. So, uh, and some people say the best thing is to put the, the uh, a ceramide on after a shower. I learned that from you, Jim. But tell me a little bit more about that. Well, my, my old game is it's going to work better if you put it on when the skin is damp. And a lot of people will complain. I, I tried to use this lotion, but when I did, it burned. So I always tell them, well, here's the answer. When you take your shower, bathe, as soon as you're done, get out, dry off, and while the skin's still damp, apply your lotion. All right, good. Sarah V Cream will be right back after this. As your baby grows, there are new surprises and adventures every day. With each new milestone, remember, immunizations are safe and one of the best ways to protect against serious diseases especially between birth and age five. Now that my grandson Henry has reached his first birthday and our granddaughter Stella has arrived, we're making sure that they stay on their immunization schedules. Schedule your children's immunizations today for baby's sake. Despite his caring and interesting conversation, I heard very little of it because his large, rosy, bulbous, and bumpy nose had stolen my attention. Years later, when I met him again, he looked like a different man. 
the rosacea and rhinophyma skin condition, which had made his face so red and nose so massive, was calmed down with medication, and the excessive growth of the skin over the nose had been trimmed away by laser scalpel. This time, my eyes were no longer drawn to that globular and swollen proboscis, and instead, I was able to see his kind and wizened eyes. Acne rosacea, or more commonly called just rosacea, affecting 14 million people in the U.S., or 5% of the population, is sometimes said to be an adult version of acne vulgaris. We see rosacea more often in 30 to 50-year-old women, and it can flare as menopause approaches. When it does affect men, it can be severe. And in a percentage of cases, rosacea can cause an ever-growing piling up of skin over the nose called rhinophyma. Rosacea more often targets fair-skinned, freckle-faced, blonde or red-headed, blue-eyed people who flush easily. It seems triggered by sun exposure, hot drinks, hot baths and showers, hot spicy food, stress, exercise, and steroid medications. Of course, one way to prevent rosacea is to try to avoid such triggers. Acne vulgaris, or more commonly called just acne, is similar to rosacea. Seems also related to hormonal swings, but it affects about 85% of all U.S. adolescents. And more often than rosacea, causes whiteheads and blackheads. Adolescents living in Western, modernized societies struggle with acne. However, it affects very few in non-industrialized society. This has led some experts to believe acne, and also rosacea, might be made worse by soap, excessive cleanliness, antibiotic use, and alteration of the normal flora living in our skin that protects us from invasive bacteria, like grass on a lawn protects against weeds. The two conditions of rosacea and acne have common methods of treatment. Over-the-counter lotions like benzoyl peroxide, prescription antibiotics, and vitamin A, both in lotion and pill form, are all still the mainstay of therapy. In contrast, recently there's a trend to move towards supporting one's normal flora, avoiding antibiotics, cleansing agents, or oil-removing methods, and even trying probiotics. This is all in an effort to reestablish a lawn of protection to fight against the invasion of weeds. Well, any of these treatments are effective in most people, but not all. So if you don't find relief with typical treatments, or your nose starts growing, it's time to see the dermatologist. I sincerely want to thank our three great volunteer guests, John, Louie, and Jim. We could not have done as well as we did tonight without all you three of you answering. Thanks so much, and Ra Lambda Chi. Well, that does it for tonight. Thank you again for, to South Dakota Public Broadcasting here in Vermilion for being such a wonderful host. We may do this again someday, and thank you all at home for allowing us to come into your living rooms for another hour. We generally appreciate it. So from all of you here at On Call with the Prairie Doc, until next time, stay healthy out there, people. Eating a good meal can bring us great pleasure unless you have potentially painful conditions, bleeding ulcers, and the upper digestive system. Next time, On Call with the Prairie Doc. Funding for On Call with the Prairie Doc is provided in part by... Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call Television as it continues to open doors for important medical information. And by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, an organization working with the state's healthcare community to improve quality of care as part of the Great Plains Innovation Network. 
Additional funding is provided by Aberdeen Asthma and Allergy, Avera Heart Hospital, Brookings Health System, Dakota Allergy and Asthma, Dakota Care, Orthopedic Institute, Physicians Care Sanford Clinic Community Service Committee, South Dakota State Medical Association, Swiftel Communications, and Vance Thompson Vision. Closed captioning for On Call with the Prairie Doc is provided by Avera, Brookings Health System, and Fishback Financial Corporation.